Contentment is a pleasant feeling, but it's not a feeling that is compatible with self-esteem. Well, why do I say that? Well, once in the supermarket, I saw on the shelf that's where they sell evaporated milk that there was a can of milk that said milk from contented cows. And I thought, why should I care whether cows are contented or not? Well, obviously, this producer wants to impress me that his product is superior to others. His milk is better than other milk. Why is his milk better than other milk? Because his cows are contented and that makes them excellent cows. Oh, so the degree of excellence in a cow depends on how content the cow is. And if what I'm looking for in life is to be content, right, then I share a goal in life, a standard of life of excellence with cows. And I'm too proud for that. Uh, nothing wrong with being content. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having pleasure. Nothing wrong with enjoying life. But come on, as human beings, we have a greater ability, we have a greater responsibility to make something of ourselves. And if we were able to do those two things, to first of all identify what are our character defects and then work upon them to eliminate them and to identify what are our character strength and abilities that we can use to advance ourselves then I think we'd be well on the road to a good self-esteem and uh, have the uh, proper attitude uh, to be uh, successful. So we've seen some of the ways in which a person may have low self-esteem and uh, uh, I do want to get into a few minutes about how self-esteem can manifest itself, manifest itself in our daily life. But I did make a statement earlier that self-esteem may be global, meaning a person may have feelings of inadequacy in every way, or it may be partial or compartmentalized. So let me give an example of that. Uh, I chose as my personal physician the physician who, the doctor who I recognized was the best doctor in the hospital staff. Was a wonderful person and a very, very competent doctor. He would come to the hospital at 6.30 in the morning and he had many patients who he took care of and he would spend time and see all of his patients and uh, then he would go into the electrocardiogram room and do all the interpretation of the electrocardiographs. And then he would go into the medical record room and do whatever he had to do in the medical record room. And then he would teach some student nurses. And then he would teach some medical students. And then somewhere around one o'clock, he would take off to his private office. And he would stay in his private office until about six o'clock, come back from the hospital, again, make the rounds, see his patients, et cetera, et cetera and hang around the hospital until around 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. Well, one night I was on duty and here Dr. J was uh, walking down the hall, it was close to midnight, and one of the nurses said to the other, that man never wants to be home. You know, he's always here at the hospital, right? Uh, I suppose that his wife is a very terrible person. Well, uh, sometime later, Dr. J came over to me and he said, uh, Hey, I wonder if you would see my wife. She's gone into a depression. And uh, I gave her an antidepressant, but I really shouldn't be taking care of her. So would you see her? I said, of course. Well, I was anticipating this terrible woman. You know, and the person who came in was the most gentle, lovely person that you can imagine. And she said to me, she said, Dr. Tversky, you know how devoted John is to, to his medical practice. But she just says, I'm a very needy person and I needed a shoulder to put my head on. He was never home for that. Our children grew up without a father. If they were sick, he treated them. But to give them guidance or advice, uh, he was never there for that. 
Well, then I got to know my doctor a little bit better, and I realized what the problem was. You see, he knew that as a doctor, he was excellent. He was competent. He knew his medicine, he knew his laboratory, he knew his electrocardiograms, he knew his the radiology, he, he knew his diagram, he knew everything that he was supposed to know about medicine. And so being in a hospital where he felt competent, right, that was comfortable. But now he's gonna go home. And at home they don't need anybody to do physical diagnosis or to read laboratory studies, electrocardiograms or x-rays. They need a person to whom to relate. He did not feel about himself that as a person that he had any merit, that there was anything that he could contribute to anyone as a person. And consequently, he ended up depriving his family of a uh, wonderful father and of a uh, devoted husband. So you see, in his situation, his self -esteem, low self-esteem was not global because there was part of his life that he knew he was very competent. But it was just in other parts that he did not feel competent and in those parts he avoided. Now there may be times when it's necessary to stay late at the office. That, that happens no matter what your practice is, whatever your work you do. There may be times like that. But I think that many people who spend extraordinarily late hours at the office may be doing what Dr. J is doing. They are staying where they are comfortable because home is uncomfortable, not because there's anybody at home that is uh, irritating or bad or whatever, but because they don't feel about themselves that they have anything to offer as a human being. And that is, a, unfortunately, a serious mistake. And you can easily see why that is going to interfere with a person's success. Right? A person who feels inadequate about oneself is not going to make good human relations.